Happy Tuesday, everyone. Thank you all very much for coming to today's webinar on improving research collaboration and transparency using the open science framework to enhance your research projects. My name is Jennifer Abel. I am the training coordinator for the Portage Network. And to begin by acknowledging that the land which I'm speaking to you from is the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Coast Salish peoples, including the Musqueam, the Squamish, and the tsleil -Waututh. In this webinar, we're going to look at how keeping data and materials organized across all phases of the research process is always a challenging process. To help the research community address these challenges, the Center for Open Science developed the Open Science Framework, or OSF, a research tool that supports collaboration, data management, and transparency through the research life cycle. The OSF provides avenues for researchers to design a study, collect, analyze, and store data, manage collaborators, and publish research materials. Today, we're going to learn about the many features of the OSF and develop strategies for using the tool within the context of your own research project. We'll frame the discussion around how best to utilize the OSF while also implementing data management and open science best practices. And a reminder that this is the sixth webinar in our co-presented series with Global Water Futures. This is a series that aims to educate researchers and data professionals across Canada on research data management best practices and tools that are available to support you. These webinars will help you navigate the evolving RDM landscape as funders, publishers, and the research community increasingly require good RDM practices. A couple of housekeeping things before we get started. Uh, you have been muted automatically when you entered the room. This webinar is being recorded and the chat may be archived for those who are unable to attend. We encourage you to use the latest version of Zoom so that you have access to all of the features, in including security updates, but don't update in the middle of the webinar. You might miss something. Please use the chat feature if you're having technical difficulties or have additional resources to share. And please use the Q&A option to ask any questions of the presenter. Uh, we'll address the questions at the end. You may also raise your hand if you wish to ask a question. Questions may be asked in English or in French. We do have a code of conduct that we find in these webinars, which you can find at the web address on your screen, which will be in the chat shortly as well. Carl and the Portage Network are committed to providing a welcoming, safe, and harassment-free environment for its staff, membership, committees, and working groups, as well as for participants, speakers, and organizers of Carl meetings and events. We do not tolerate harassment of any kind. And now on to our presenter, who is Kevin Reed from the University of Saskatchewan where he's a health, science, health sciences librarian. He's been providing data services in health science libraries for the past eight years in both Canada and the US. He's the current chair of the Portage Network's Data Discovery Expert Group and is in the process of conducting research on how Canadian funded researchers describe and share their data. And now Kevin, the uh, virtual and pixelated floor is yours. Thank you, Jennifer. I'm going to make sure my screen gets shared here. Success? Success. Oh, okay, perfect. Thank you. So hi everyone. As Jennifer mentioned, my name is Kevin Reed and I'm here to today to talk to you about using the Open Science Framework and doing so specifically to help you think about how you can enhance your research projects. So before I get started, I just wanted to provide a line acknowledgement of my own. I acknowledge that I live and work on Treaty 6 territory and the homeland of the Métis. I pay my respects to the First Nations and Métis ancestors of this place in which I work and live. A little bit about me, as Jennifer already mentioned, I am a health sciences librarian at USASC, and I've really been thinking about and supporting data management, data sharing, and open science for the past eight years. Uh, before coming to the University of Saskatchewan, I worked at the National Institutes of Health in the US and before, uh, after that, the NYU School of Medicine. Currently, a lot of my research and a lot of my efforts are trying to integrate open science practices into undergraduate education programs so that people who are just starting out research are thinking about how they can make research open from beginning to the end of their process. So the plan for today is really to examine the open science framework tool within the context of open science best practices. So not just teach you how the tool is used, but how you can think about potentially implementing that tool across the entire research life cycle. I'm going to be looking at exploring the features of OSF and its capabilities so you can make a decision as to whether or not it will be a useful tool for you. 
I'm going to use some of my own case studies of how I've used OSF to demonstrate how it can be used in practice. And finally, I'm going to highlight the advantages and disadvantages of using the Open Science Framework. I want to put, provide a disclaimer. I am not a representative of the Open Science Framework or the Center for Open Science. I'm a user of the tool, and I want to make sure that I highlight what I find really valuable about the tool, but also what I don't find as useful so that you can make an informed decision based on what you would like to do. Okay. So before I get started, I want to provide a little bit of clarification on what I mean by open science. So open science can be seen as an umbrella term for a lot of different aspects of research. We have everything from open access to open research to open source software to citizen science, as well as, as equity of access to research products across the life cycle. And open science as a term makes, might make you think of the physical or hard sciences as the only potential use case for practicing open science. But what I want to do, and I, what I want you to think about over the course of this presentation, within the context of the open science framework, is that I'm really looking at open research, regardless of the type of research that it is. And what open science framework does for you is focus on how to make all of these different research products open from beginning to end within the research process. So to start off, I, I want to, to root ourselves in the research lifecycle because I think it will help us think about all of the different products that we might generate over the course of our research practices. And so from the very beginning of a research project, we may have an idea. We may ask a research question. We may be reviewing other existing research that's already happened on our topic and developing a hypothesis. From there, we're developing instruments. We might be planning experiments, developing protocols, and identifying the participants or subjects or, or content that we're going to study to help us answer that question. Once we've come up with the methods that we use, we're gathering information, whether it's text, numbers, images, or videos, we're storing that information, and hopefully we're describing it so that it's understandable for us as well as for anybody else who might use it. And then from there, we're building an analysis plan. We might use software to analyze our data and or our information, and we're transforming it in, in some way to help us synthesize to answer our question. And then finally, and, and obviously the ultimate goal for many of us in the way that research currently works is that our, we want to publish what we found. And so we might present at a conference, we might publish in a journal, and we might share research data if, if we're in that phase of, of research currently. Um, and by focusing only on the publication phase, the, the current practices in research really hones in on rewarding and focusing on Let's get that publication out there. But when we think about that within the context of the whole life cycle, the publication is really only the tip of the iceberg in terms of the information that you could provide that would allow someone to truly understand how you approached your research, what products you created, and how you implemented all of those practices to come up with your final result, which is a summary in the form of a publication. So when we think about open science or open research more broadly, it's really about exposing all of these different elements from each phase of the life cycle so that people can actually see our instruments or our experiments or see the way that we collected this information or look at our study protocol so that they can get a better sense of what our research looks like from start to finish. And so when we think about open science from this iceberg, it's really about unleashing and unearthing and opening up all of the other products of research that we create over the course of a research process, from our study protocols to the software we use, to code books or data dictionaries that help other people understand our research. The focus is here is on transparency and openness so that you're not just seeing that snippet of information, you're seeing the entire picture of a research process from start to finish. And so from that perspective, it's important to ask ourselves, well, why does this matter? Well, well, first of all, it's going to help us improve the transparency, reproducibility, and reuse of research. If we have access to all of these different types of research products, we, we have a better sense of how you went about your work. We could potentially reproduce those experiments for our own purposes or to check the validity of the findings of a research project, or we could even reuse the research for other research products in the future. And so by unleashing and opening up all of these research products, we have a better chance of using it and seeing the process in full. This also is really helpful for avoiding duplication of efforts. So if I know that a research project is already underway or someone's already created a data collection instrument that I could use, 
I don't have to reinvent the wheel. If I can see it because it's openly available, I have a chance of either seeing research and avoiding recreating a research project that maybe didn't work, or I can potentially use a tool or instrument that's going to help me in my actual project going forward. This is especially important as we think about things like COVID-19 right now. And as we're seeing research being released much more rapidly, we're doing this so that people aren't recreating the same trials. And we're also being able to see the types of treatments that are effective at a very current and rapid rate. By opening up our research, we're also increasing the potential for collaboration. So if we're making our research known at the outset is when we start a project, people might be able to see that you're working on it and maybe working on something similar, which will establish collaborations across the country or internationally. And finally, the general ethos around open science or open research is that publicly funded research should be open and not just in the form of a publication, but all of those research products that are created and that human beings or people have invested time and money into so that people can access it and have it be openly available. So when we think about open science in action, we can turn all of those different research products into actually how we practice open research or open science. And from the idea phase, we can pre-register our projects, which I'm gonna talk a little bit about briefly in a few slides. We can share our methods and our instruments and our tools as we develop them. We can describe our data or whatever our data might be, whether it's physical numbers or it's a textbook or it's artwork. Um, we can be transparent about how we analyze our data and share our analysis plans in any way that we can. And then finally, sharing our publication data and tools so that they're openly available. Now, the benefit of working within the open science framework is that it's actually open science by design. So as you think about the research lifecycle, what the open science framework is trying to do, and, and it does quite well, is that it provides you with avenues for sharing all of these research products throughout that life cycle. So they have a pre-registration function. They have open methods and tools. They have the ability for you to manage your data effectively. There's the potential for reproducibility and reuse with an open science framework. And they offer a multiple modes of, of sharing the outputs of your research, whether that's in a preprint form before peer review, whether you want to share your data, your software, or the publication itself. And so just quickly, um, before I dive into showing you what the open science framework looks like within the context of what I've been talking about, I wanted to gauge um, those of you in the audience today um, and ask you, first of all, have you ever pre-registered a research project before you started working on it? And Jennifer is gonna share a poll with you now and hopefully it will come up here in a second. Seems appropriate that we have a few polls today. Yes. It, it does. I wasn't going to bring it up, but that's okay. <laughs> There'll be a few polls here in succession. So let's wait and see the results of that as people put in their votes. Yeah, we'll give it a few more seconds here. Okay. All ballots will be counted. Last call. All right. Okay, let's see the results. Okay. So very few yeses, a few no's, and a few I'm not familiar. And that's okay because I'm going to talk about pre-registration in a lot more detail um, moving forward. So on to the next poll. Have you ever openly shared your methods, your protocols, any instruments that you've built or any tools you use for research before you published? And this is going to help give me some context for where everyone's at. And hopefully by the end of this presentation, when you see what the open science framework can do, it will potentially change your mind on how you approach this. And I mean anywhere. So Prospero works, absolutely. Sorry, I, I just saw these chats. Um, so in any place, regardless of where it is. So it doesn't have to just be in the open science framework if you've ever pre-registered, or in this case, if you've ever shared your methods or protocols with someone before you published. 
Okay, a couple last votes coming in. Okay. All right. Take a look. Okay, so a few more yeses in this case and a few more no's as well. And that's perfectly fine. So the open science framework in this case, I'm going to show you is a really easy way to share methods and protocols before you publish. And then our final one, which really takes us to the end of the research cycle. Um, have any of you shared your research data before or after publication? So that would be the data underlying the results of a publication. So that's our last poll. And that could this be- This one looks either, like it's gonna be a close vote. Is it? Okay. So that could be either you shared with someone who requested your data. That could be that you put your data into a repository. It's entirely um, up to you as to how you've shared, but I'm just curious to see if this is something that people on the call have thought about before. Oh, we're in a dead heat. This is funny. <laughs> Come on. Oh, there we go. Okay. Well, All right. It, good. it means people are thinking about this, which is great. All right. I think that's probably good. Okay. Wow. Okay. Excellent. So it's nice to see. Interesting that we have more people sharing at the end of the life cycle rather than sort of sharing at the beginning and along the way. So hopefully today you'll think a little bit more about how you can open up those different products of research throughout the process as well. And so what I want to focus on today is, is some of the key features of what the open science framework offers within the context of what I've been talking about in the realm of open science. Um, and that is everything from being able to register your work, to organize your projects, to manage collaborators, to utilize version control for better data management, to connect to well-known tools that you might already be using uh, through, for your research projects, and finally, to share your work. But before I do that, I just want to go into the basics of the Open Science Framework for those of you on the call who aren't familiar with the tool whatsoever. So this is what every single Open Science Framework page looks like when you log in and create a project with the Open Science Framework. On the top, you have a title, which includes the contributors, the affiliated institution of the authors of the particular project, the date it was created and the date it was last updated, and a description of that project. The affiliated institutions in Canada currently, I believe only University of British Columbia has a license and no one else does, but that does not prohibit you from using the open science framework whatsoever. The next section that's set up is that there's a number of quadrants within the open science framework page that's broken up into discrete elements. And the first is a wiki that allows you to write out information about your project. I've seen people use it to capture notes from meetings as well as put in experimental protocols into the wiki as well. So it's really up to you as to how you might use this within the context of your project. Below that, you have the file section, which allows you to link to all of the different files available through your project. Anything that you link through to will also be available here and all the different storage directories that you have will be located in this file section. From there, you have an activity log. And this is one of the beauties of OSF is that any change that is made by a certain collaborator on your project will be seen and tracked and logged over time. So if someone makes a change, uploads a new version, creates a new component, deletes a file, all of that will be captured and represented within the project itself. Above that, we have the component section. And I'm going to talk a little bit about components later. But what this allows you to do is to break up your project into a number of discrete components. So whether you're looking at organizing your methods or your raw data or your analysis, or if you have code, or if you have presentations you want to share, you can cluster and organize them in any way that you'd like so that it's easy for you to break up that information into your project. And this sort of serves as a lower level hierarchy to your upper level project, which is the open science framework. And then from there, we have the citation information. So every project in the OSF is citable so that no matter what you make open, you can get credit for it by allowing people to cite the project directly. 
And then finally, at the top, just so we're all aware, there's a menu bar, which allows you to access all of the different variations I just talked about from an easy menu at the very top. So that's just the regular layout of the homepage, but I feel like it's important to know so that as I talk about some of the additional features, you'll be able to have a better sense of what that looks like. Okay, so now let's get into some of the key features of the OSF and, and how we focus on it and, and what it can do for you in the context of opening up your research more broadly. So the first thing that you can do in the Open Science Framework is pre-register your work. So what pre-registration means is that you're making your hypothesis, your analysis plan, or your entire project plan public before you even start that project. So you can see here that in the Open Science Framework, we have information about a study registration that has happened, but it hasn't quite started yet. So you have the study information, you have a sampling plan below that, you have a list of contributors on the right-hand side, <clears throat> as well as the date that the project was registered. And at the end of your project, when you go to publish, you can actually link this registration through to the final publication so that what you said you did in the pre-registration matches what you did in the publication. And, and the goal of pre-registration isn't just to make people aware of your research projects, but it's also to make sure that you're eliminating bias and that you're held accountable for what you say that you're, get, you're going to do that you actually do. So when you create a pre-registration in the Open Science Framework, it creates a time-stamped immutable version of your project. So it freezes it in time to show that you've committed to this plan as what you're going to do for your research process. And it's ultimately there to improve the transparency, reproducibility, and discovery of your research. If any of you on the call work in an institute or a collaborative of some type, you can actually develop a brand registry for that entire collaborative, which would, for a fee, allow people to search within an entire individual project all of the different registrations for your research initiative. So that's an option for you as well if you work in an institute or a center of some kind. The next phase is being able to organize your projects. So as I mentioned before, you can easily group files into sections called components. And this is great for you to be able to break up your projects into different components. Um, they serve as subcategories within a hierarchical structure. So each individual component serves as its own project page that looks exactly the same as the page you see on the screen here. And every component can have subcomponents and those components can have subcomponents as well. So you can drill down as, into the most granular way that you want to, depending on how you like to organize your own research projects. Each component can also be assigned specific collaborators. So let's say you're working with a massive team that has people who come in and out of your project. You can decide which components they have access to. So if you have a graduate student you're working with and you only want them to have access to the methods section, but not the raw data, you can do that. So you have a lot of flexibility as to how you create these components and divvy up responsibilities between them. Speaking of collaborators, you have the option of managing collaborators very well within the context of the OSF projects. So you can, anyone you add as a contributor to your project can be assigned a different permission level. You have the option of administrator, read and write, or simply read only. And in, what's important to know here is that if you want to add someone to your OSF project, they need to already have an OSF account. So if they don't have an OSF account and you go to search for them, you will not find them there. So ultimately, before you start an OSF project, you want to make sure that everyone on your team is set up with an OSF account, which I'm going to demo a little bit later. I also want to draw your attention to the checkbox next to everyone's name, which talks about being a bibliographic contributor. So a bibliographic contributor allows you to decide whether or not someone's name shows up in the citation that that is available on the Open Science Framework project homepage. So let's say, again, you have someone who is involved in the project in maybe a less than authorship uh, relevant way. You can uncheck their name and they will not be listed as an author on the, the, the citation for that project. So something that gives you a little bit more flexibility there as well. Another really useful feature from a data management perspective is the ability to utilize version control. One of the things that I think OSF does really well is keep track of versioning and documentation of all the different phases of your research project as you continue to work on them. Um, just to give you a little bit of background, 
OSF has a really interesting approach to providing storage for free to people who use the Open Science Framework. So if you choose to keep your project private while using the Open Science Framework, they will offer you five gigabytes of, of free storage for you to use. However, if you choose an opt to make your project public, you have 50 gigabytes of, of storage to use. So they're really trying to incentivize people to making all aspects of their research open, which I think is a good thing. So as I mentioned in OSF, you can track the versions of every project that you do, um, as long as you're uploading files with the same name to the same folder. And as you can see on the screenshot here, you can see the list of versions in the first shot. And then the one in the bottom right hand screen will show you the revisions page, which lists every single version, which is date and time stamped and has a unique identifier associated with it. And you can download any version that you'd like. And of course, as you make changes to these versions, they're tracked in the activity log that I discussed in the basics tutorial. Another benefit to the Open Science Framework is the ability to connect to well-known tools. So OSF syncs with all of the different tools you see available on the screen. So if you work within Google Drive or Dropbox or Box and you want to pull over data or information about your research project into OSF, you can directly link that project folder in Google Drive with the Open Science Framework. Similarly, if you want to have all of your publications organized and available within the Open Science Framework project, you can link through to DataCite for your data citations or Mendeley or Zotero. And then if you're um, someone who's familiar and comfortable with software and wants to make that available, you can link up with your GitHub account, which will track all the changes in GitHub as well as RStudio. So it can be very useful for that purpose. However, the version control that OSF offers for its internal storage isn't quite as useful um, when you're linking out to these other products. You're relying more on using the products in their own space. And then finally, the real best part for me about the Open Science Framework is that you can share any type of research output. So it does not care if it's a data set or it's a presentation or it's a video or it's a publication any type of research product that you want to make available, the Open Science Framework can accommodate it. So you're not limited to looking only for data repositories, or you're not limited to only looking for preprint servers. All of it is packaged up into one place, and you can decide what you want to make available. The OSF provides the ability to assign digital object identifiers, or DOIs, to your projects, which again will permanently timestamp the project to be citable at one point in time and be persistent um, for the future. And in addition to the DOI, which helps you keep that preservation version of your project, you can also apply a license to your project to dictate the terms of use. So if you are working on software or a certain project and you, you don't want it to be used for commercial purposes, you can add a license to it to make sure that you're dictating how other people use the content in your project. As I mentioned before, all the projects are citable in any format. And then on the screenshot at the bottom right hand of the screen, you can see that it offers the citation in various formats, depending on the purposes or the guidelines that you use. And on top of that, there's a preprint server that's available for you to publish your research before peer review. And you can connect all of that directly within the OSF project as a whole. So it's another really useful tool. And to me, one of the key features of what the Open Science Framework has to offer. Okay, so thinking about that, I want to transition a little bit to doing an OSF demo. So I'm going to back out of this for a second and get myself over to the Open Science Framework page. And I'm just going to log into my Proton, my one password here, so I can log in. Okay, hold on. Pardon me. Okay, so one of the things I wanted to, to focus on here is that Right now, I have been talking about the Open Science Framework as a tool for you to make your research openly available. But what's important to think about is that this also opens up an opportunity for you to have access to all kinds of different research projects that are already underway or already being worked on. So this is both a tool for you to make your research available, but also for you to find public research. So the Open Science Framework homepage, as you see here, allows you to discover 
anything based on the keywords that you use. So let's say I wanted to search for public health projects. I can search for public health. And it's going to show me a list of all of the preprints on the topic of public health, all of the open science framework projects about public health, all of the files associated with it, the components, the different registrations that have been done and the users and all of it is available here and I can click on anything that I want. So here is a project about public health informatics training. And now I can see a project about this and I can see the contributors and I have access to all of the data and information about these particular projects. So just remember that this isn't just a tool for you to make your research discoverable, it's also a tool for you to find research as well. So from the OSF home section on the left-hand side, you also have the option of exploring the preprints that are available within the Open Science Framework. And the benefit to the Open Science Framework preprint section is that they collaborate with all of the different other types of, of Open Science um, preprint servers that are available. So if I search for COVID-19, as an example, you can see all of the other types of preprint servers are aggregated here. So all of the different providers are available on the left-hand side. And I can access any of these preprints directly from the Open Science Framework. So it's not only serving as a preprint server for Open Science Framework projects, but also as an aggregator of all preprint servers available that you see listed on the left-hand side of this page. And then finally, as I mentioned before, I want to highlight the point of registrations. So this is something that you would submit before beginning a research project in earnest. And in the same way, you'll be able to search for registrations within the Open Science Framework project, and you can also browse the most recent registrations. And just to show you what this might look like from the perspective in full, because I only showed you a screenshot, here we have a project on pragmatic adaptation. And you can see the contributors here and the data was registered and the project it's associated with on the Open Science Framework. And then if I scroll down, you can see all of the information that they provided about their project before they began. So their research question, their hypothesis, their sampling plan, the variables they're going to use to collect data, the design plan they're going to use, if they're going to use blinding, any randomization, as well as the analysis plan that they're going to use. So what statistical model they're going to do. And so again, the benefit of pre-registering your study is that you've really laid the landscape for what you're going to do and you're holding yourself accountable and reducing bias in your research results. So consider using the pre-registration in your own research to help make your research discoverable at the outset and to increase that transparency of research overall. So now if I go back to the OSF homepage, <clears throat> This is where I want to show you signing up and, and registering for your own projects. So in order to sign in, I'm just going to go to the sign in page on the right hand side. And you have the option of signing up with your ORCID account. For those of you who aren't familiar with ORCID, it is a unique identifier that allows you to track all of your research outputs in one place. If you have an institutional account, you can also sign in via your institution. And finally, you can just sign in with your email, which is what I've done here. So I'm gonna sign into the project or into the interface and it's going to immediately take you to a dashboard on the page. So the dashboard should com be comprised of all of the different elements um, of your particular projects that you've created over time. So what I want to do to start out is create my own project, which is what I'm gonna do now. And when you create a project, you just have to pr provide a title. So I'm gonna call this Portage Webinar Example. And then if you're affiliated with an institution, you will see the affiliation option here. I'm no longer affiliated with NYU, so I'm going to remove that because I don't want this project to be affiliated with that institution. And then you have the option of this choosing the storage location. So because it recognizes my IP as Canadian, it's going to offer me the Canadian Montreal storage location, but you also have the option of the United States, Australia, um, Germany, but for now, I'm going to stick with Canada. And then from here, I can enter my project description, which is basic metadata about my project. And I encourage you to use this if you plan to use Open Science Framework, as it's one of the only ways people can get a snapshot of what your, your project's actually about. 
And then finally, let's say that you're, you have a very common way of doing research throughout your life cycle and throughout every project that you do. You can set up one OSF project that has all of the components and all of the structure that you like, and then you could use it as a template for future projects so that you never have to recreate and reinvent the wheel ever again. You can simply use the same, same template over and over and over again. So from here, I'm gonna click create. <clears throat> and it's gonna tell me that my new project was created successfully. And I'm now going to go to the project so that we can take a look. So now you'll see basically a stripped down empty version of what I showed you in some of the slides where I have my name as a contributor. I have no affiliation. It has my date that was created, the category and the, the simple description here. Now, normally the first thing I would do when I'm starting a project is I would go to add contributors. So I'm going to go up to the left hand side up top here and click on contributors. And so from here, it has me listed as an administrator and a bibliographic contributor and if I want to add somebody new, I would click add, and then I would have to search for their name. So I'm going to search for my colleague, Sarah Rutley. I think she's even on this call. Hi, Sarah. And because Sarah already has an account, you can see that she immediately pops up. So it shows me that she has an account and that her representation is University of Saskatchewan and the University of Alberta, and that we have six projects in common. If I did a search and I couldn't find someone, it means either again, that they haven't signed up for an account and what I could do is add them as an unregistered contributor, which would then send them an email and prompt them to create an account so that they would be added to the project. So it's not the end of the world if they're not there, but I find it's just easier for whoever's convening or organizing the project to make sure that everyone on their team has an account set up. So because I don't want to inundate Sarah with an email, I'm not going to officially add her to this project, but that's the process you would take. And then from there, what I like to do is see if there are any add-ons that I want to, to include into my project. So I mentioned before that you can link up your OSF project with a number of different other tools that are available, and all of them are available in the scrolling pattern here. So you can see that there is a Dataverse option here. So any of you who have deposited data into an institutional data repository like Dataverse, can enable that connection and import that data directly into the open science framework. The same goes with Figshare or GitHub for software or Mendeley for articles or OneDrive for people who are storing data on OneDrive. But let's say I want to enable Google Drive as an option. By doing that, anytime I want to enable one of these add-ons, it's going to offer me terms of service and tell me what's going to happen once I connect my Google Drive with my open science framework. So here you can see information about permissions, um, about downloading files. You can also see under the delete files section here that if I delete a file on OSF, it's gonna be vanished from Google Drive as well. So just really important for you to read through the terms of service and make sure that you're comfortable with connecting any of these tools in real time. So I'm just gonna click confirm. And then what will happen is your add-ons will show up below in this screen and then you can import your account from a profile. For the sake of time, I'm not going to do that, but ultimately you would just log in with your Google address and pick the folders you'd want to incorporate into your OSF project. So now I'm gonna go back to the homepage, which you can always go get to from the Portage webinar example, which is always gonna be in a larger font on the side. And then just go through some of these features a little bit more closely. So. The wiki is one option, and as I mentioned, you can use the wiki for whatever you'd like. And by clicking on the wiki view, I have the option of typing in real time and saying, this is a wiki. I can make this bold. I can italicize it. I can do whatever I want with it, and then I could save it. You can create as many pages or projects as you want within the open science framework. So if I wanted to have one that's called experimental protocols, I could add that and it would be another page. So ultimately you have the flexibility to use the wiki for whatever you'd like. And some people really rely heavily on it as the main place where all of their information is stored. Whereas others I find don't use it at all. So that just gives you an idea of the, the ways you can use the wiki. So I'm gonna go back to the homepage again. 
Now below this, you're going to see the file section. So within the file section, you'll notice here that I have an OSF storage option that's from Canada and Montreal. And so if I want to upload anything into this particular project, I can close this and I can go to my desktop. And from there, all I need to do to add folders is simply click and drag. And so when you click and drag, <clears throat> Ultimately, it uploads your files very easily and there's no problem. If you want to make edits to any of your files, you can select the file and you'll notice here that it's going to show me a snippet of this file, which is an executive summary of a data analysis project I've been working on and it's showing me my first version. So when you're working with a number of people on a project in OSF to keep your data management intact, everyone has the option of checking out the project. And so once I check out the file, it's going to say no one else can edit, delete, or upload new versions as long as it's checked out, which is great. So I'm going to do that. And then from here, I can take this particular file and I can download it and I can open it. And I'm just going to show you what it looks like to, to upload a new version of this project. So in this particular file, what I can do is I can enable editing and I'm just going to say, version control for demo purposes. And I'm going to save that. And I'm going to save it in my desktop. And the important thing is to save it in the exact same name, because that's the only way that OSF is going to remember that it's the same file and create the same version. So I can click save. I'm going to replace my existing file. And now if I go back to the OSF, I can go to my file here. One second. And then I can take my file from my directory and upload it back into my folder. And now you should see that this has transformed itself to version two. So I can open up this file. And within that project, <clears throat> now you can see that I have two versions. You can see that this new version has my change embedded within it, and I can see any revisions I want at any time using the revisions button on the right. So I have a date stamp, a timestamp, who did it, and a download option. And then I can check it back in. And so that's how you keep your, your data and your, your project managed and organized effectively within OSF in a nutshell. So going back to my project example, I also want to show you that because I did all of that work just now, the activity log captured all of that information. I'm just gonna make this a little bit bigger. It captured all that information for me really easily. Above that, I have the option of enhancing the discoverability of my project with tags. And this is a way so that if somebody was to search for your project, you wanted to make it as discoverable as possible. I could say Portage Network, I want it to be OSF, I want it to talk about open science, and then hopefully when people search for those particular topics, they'll be able, this project will show up for them. And then finally, we have the component section. So if I want to add a component to my project, I have the option of calling this component whatever I want. So let's say I'm going to call it methods. And I'm going to, again, remove the affiliation. And I can, again, choose the storage location. Now, this is the option where I have the, the uh, option of either adding all of the contributors for my project to this example, or I can be more selective about it afterwards. I can also assign a license to an individual component as well. I can provide a description, and then I can create a category for the project. So whether it's methods or a hypothesis or data, the OSF has provided some nice little tools to allow you to decide what that might look like. So I'm going to click methods and measures. I'm going to select create and I'm going to keep working in this project page. And what I want to draw your attention to now is that I now under my file directory have a, a totally different component called methods with its own storage component. So it's creating a discrete separate element from my broader scale project. And then if I was to click on the methods component here, you'll notice that 
It's its own project that is a blank slate again, just as it was with the broader project. And it's only delineated by the fact that you can see the larger scale project at the top with the methods at the bottom. But everything else is the same underneath. So just a couple more things I wanted to go over so you could see some of the other features is if I wanted to make this project public and get access to that 50 gigs of data, I would simply just need to make the project public. And what it will remind me of and send me a warning of is make sure that you don't have any sensitive data, whether through the add-ons you've included or through any of the files that you've uploaded. And once you've made it public, you should assume it will always be public. And then you can decide if you have multiple components, whether you want to make all of them public or only a few of them public. Again, for demonstration purposes, I'm not going to do that, but this is the way that you could really unleash and open up your research from the very beginning of the process. And then finally, because I mentioned the idea of licensing, if once you've finished your project, you can add a license whenever you'd like. And so to do that, you would just click on add a license and you have the option of choosing all of the licenses that are available to you. So whether you want it to be Creative Commons, whether it's code, whether it's copyleft, um, there's give, they're giving you lots of different options for you to be able to use the license in any way that you feel is necessary or which you'd like the terms to be for your project directly. And then you could list the copyright holders there as to who's responsible, which could be any of the authors of the project, and you can click save. Okay, so that is a, a relatively whirlwind demo of OSF within an hour. I, I do encourage you to explore it, but I wanna give you the sense that its goal and purpose is to help you keep your data managed, but also give you every opportunity to open up all aspects of your research and compartmentalize your research into different discrete elements, just as we talked about with the research lifecycle. And so what I wanted to talk about briefly before we wrap up is a couple of case studies that I've used the Open Science Framework for. And then I'll get to your questions as I see they're starting to pile up a little bit. So the first case study I wanna highlight is my own research. Um, this is the study that Jennifer mentioned at the start of the project where I'm analyzing CIHR funded publications to scope the landscape of their data sharing practices. And in the process of doing this research, I developed a study protocol I use code to extract data from PubMed. I got raw data out of PubMed. I built a data collection instrument that I used to analyze that raw data. I built an analysis plan, and then I created analysis data sets based on that. So all of these different stages of the research lifecycle, I wanted to make open and available, obviously because I'm teaching this and it's important to me, but also to show that we should be making our research open. As a completely different alternative, I also, at my work, during my time at NYU, worked on a software project to develop a, a program to help make research data more discoverable. And the goal of this was so that other institutions would find it useful and implement it at their own local instances of that project. And so in this case, what we used the OSF for was a project description and marketing to let people see the code from GitHub, all the documentation on how to implement the project, and then any of our publications and presentations. And so if we go into the OSF project, this is an example of what my particular open science framework project looks like for my research project. So I have the title of my project, the authors associated with that project, the description of that project, and then I've broken up my work into discrete components. So we have the methodology as well as the raw data from PubMed and PubMed Central. And all of that is available publicly right now including all of the Python scripts we use to extract the data. And my goal here was that every time I created something I was going to use, I made it open on the Open Science Framework. On top of this, I also registered my project. So you can see that anytime you pre-register a project, it's directly connected. So by clicking on registration, what it does is take me directly to the registration that I have for this particular research project. So by selecting that, you can see that I have my own version of a pre-registration, just as I was talking about before. And so now if I go back to my project, oops, hold on a second. You can see now that I'm logged in, I also have two components I haven't made public yet. 
And that's my analyze data section and the data analysis section. And the reason is because we're currently still analyzing data and it's not complete. So I'm still working on it and making it available in OSF, but I haven't decided to make it open yet until that process is complete. So I'm just trying to use the open science framework as a sharing tool as I move through each stage of the research lifecycle. To show you a counter example of a different way you can use the open science framework, we have the NYU data catalog, which is a tool that's being used to make hard to find research data more discoverable. In this case, we use the wiki a lot more to highlight the project. And if you look at the files, we have connections to Google Drive as well as to GitHub so that people can easily access all of our documentation and all of our information in one place so that they can use it and see it all organized in that way. We've also created a lot of tags because we want people to find it. And we've created components on code and metadata. So in this case, we're using Open Science Framework more as a showcase than as an open research tool. So just gives you a sense of the two different ways that you might be able to use Open Science Framework. I also know a lot of people use the tool to share their presentations after they've done them or a webinar and all of the associated training materials. So just to wrap up, I wanted to highlight a couple of things. As I mentioned before, I'm not a representative of the Open Science Framework, so there's a number of pros and cons that I see to the tool. In terms of pros, it, to me, it's really one of the only one-stop shops for making your project open from start to finish. A lot of other tools, you might be able to share your data, you might be able to pre-register, but to be able to do it all in one place is really the true value of what OSF provides. It's an intuitive tool that's pretty flexible and easy to use. As I mentioned, you can use it for any purpose that you want, whether it's research, whether it's open education, or whether it's you creating a software program or working on a team for some certain project. I think the ability to apply both a license and a DOI is extremely unique and is a great way to make sure that you dictate the terms of use of how your work and how your research is used. It's easy for you to manage collaborators and project components. And I think the free storage capacity and the ability to have version control for data management is a big plus. From a cons perspective, I think you have to consider whether or not transitioning your entire research workflow to the Open Science Framework makes sense for you. I also find that the analytics as to who's looking at your project and how it's being downloaded are pretty poor. I, I don't really get a good sense other than in terms of views, who's looking at my project, but I can't see the downloads as to who is actually taking things from my project directly, which I think is a huge gap in what the OSF provides. If you're using add-ons from Google Drive or from Box, the versioning is unstable and doesn't really work. So that's something to consider. And I find that this, the discoverability of projects is not as good as it could be. So when I try to search for my projects in a private Google search or in Google dataset search, even though they're, they're unique search terms, they're not coming up at the top, which I think OSF has a long way to go for that. So just a quick summary here, it's really one of the only tools in terms of the OSF that allows you to practice open science at every stage of the life cycle. It's useful as a sharing or a project management tool. It's ideal if you want to make your research products open, if you want to control the terms of use of your research and make sure that your work is cited. And just a caution for you that before you use OSF, seriously consider what your research needs are and your workflows to make sure that the tool is going to work for you. Because I have worked with others in the past who tried to make the transition and it didn't work, whereas for some people it did. So just be conscious of that before you start a project, before you leap into the tool. So just before I get into questions, I wanted to just submit one final poll. And based on what you've heard and what you've seen today, do you think the Open Science Framework would suit some element of your research needs? And this is the final poll, Jennifer. So if you could pass that one on, that would be great. Yep, we are now open for ballots. Thank you. Oh, very different split from previous polls. Oh. <clears throat> okay. And I see the 16 Q and A's, which I don't know if we'll have time to get to, but. Yeah, I don't know if we'll have time to get to all of them. <laughs> if, if we do have questions that haven't been answered, is it okay if I send them to you and get you to respond to them and then I can send them out to everyone Absolutely. along with the slides and a link to the video? Absolutely. Excellent.
Okay, let's see. If we don't get to your question in the Q and A period, uh, I will send them to Kevin, and he will he will respond in writing, and I will send them out to everyone who registered. Definitely. All right, a couple more Thank seconds you. for polling. Okay. Let's take a look. There we go. Okay. So, and the I'm not sure, I think is, is, is a good response. Like if you're not sure yet, that's perfectly fine. I think it is something that you need to explore and think about within the context of the work that you do. But I think the, the benefit to using this is it can kind of force you to be more open in your research practices. So just to wrap up quickly, I, I have a number of resources here. If obviously the open science framework is a huge landscape of a way to change your research. And there's lots of guides available online that I couldn't cover within the hour. Um, there's also a great OSF 101 page that you can use for reference as well as this particular webinar. And then what I also wanted to provide you with was there's been some recent research that highlights how other people are using the open science framework for their own research. And so I've included those resources here to help give you some perspective on what other people see as beneficial to using it and as to why. So please take a chance to look at those if you do get a chance. And with that, I'd like to thank you all for your attention today. And I'm happy to try to take any questions um, in the remaining minutes that we have available. So thank you very much. And thanks for having me, Portage. And and thank you so much, Kevin. This was uh, this was a really great introduction to uh, potentially very useful framework for a lot of people. Um, so we're okay to stick around for a few minutes longer, if you're okay to stick around for a few minutes longer, but not too long. Uh, okay. So I'll start off with the question that we got towards the beginning. Um, what is the OSF license for? So you can see other projects. So the license specifically is for you to assign to your own project so that you can dictate how people use your project. So by assigning a license to your own individual project, you can dictate whether they can use it and have to share the research that they, they do under the same license. You can restrict commercial entities from using your research. And licensing is a whole nother uh, talk really, but licenses allow you to decide how other people can take your research and what they can do with it. Whether they can share it, whether they have to cite you in order to use that research. Ultimately, it's basically a dictation of the terms of use for how you'd like your project to be used in the future. Which is an excellent response. I'm thinking this, this may have been related to why an institution would want an OSSF license like UBC ah, has. Okay, so what the OSF institutional license allows you to do is obviously brand every project as an institutional license. So whereas I from USASC currently can't indicate that my project is USASC based or USASC funded, by having an institutional license, it allows people to, first of all, attribute their work to a specific institution it does provide you with higher levels of storage based on the subscription costs that you have. And um, it also provides you with better analytics. But from my understanding, because NYU had them, you still don't get very good analytics as to how people are interacting with individual projects, how they're being downloaded. And I think that's still a really big glaring error. So ultimately, it's like a timestamp and, and a storage option for you that gives you greater flexibility into using the tool. Great, Great, thanks. Um, and this is a real quick one. Uh, could you please put back the slide with the references <laughs> <laughs> so that people can look at them while we're answering questions? Okay. Um, thanks. Okay, so uh, we'll get to a few questions from the Q&A here. Um, and this one has been upvoted. A research plan is not always linear. So what happens if your pre-registration content is different from your final publication? Can you modify the text on the pre-registration page or version the pre-registration content? So you can version the pre-registration content, but that initial stamp is frozen in time. So absolutely, I totally understand the, the way research works changes over time. I think what they're looking for specifically is things like avoiding p-hacking, right? Or someone running the same experiment over and over and over again to, to, to get a positive result. So I think what they're really trying to accomplish with a pre-registration is that your analysis and the plan you, you take to approaching your analysis is clearly outlined, but you can version a pre-registration and create a second one that would version on top of the first. 
So that, that is acceptable and applicable within the OSF framework. Good question though. Yeah, definitely a good question. There's another related one here. Um, when doing research with humans, things don't always go as planned. How can the changes in protocol can be explained in this context? So, hmm. so I think in that case, that's a good question. I'm trying to think about how to frame that. Are they, is the question asked in the context of pre-registration or just protocol more broadly? A protocol more broadly. So I think that's where the versioning system of the open science framework comes into play because I agree with you, my protocol for my project changed a number of times. And so even though I had uploaded the protocol into the methods section of my open science framework project for my study, I ended up uploading three subsequent versions with those changes. And what I do is I'm just trying to be as transparent as possible, right? So there's no given standard for how to update these things, but I just tried to comment as much as possible that this changed because X or this changed because of Y. And so I think when we're writing our protocols, as long as we're considering other people in mind when we're writing them, so it's not just our own hidden understanding of the process, but we're trying to make it as transparent and as explicit as possible as to why a change is made, Currently, that is, that is the best process we can do. And as long as we can link it to the previous versions of the files, that gives some level of transparency that isn't there before or creates assumed knowledge on behalf of someone who might come across your project and find it interesting. So I, I hope that provides a little bit of perspective, but ultimately it's, upon, it's on us to make sure we're communicating transparently those changes and why those changes happen. Great, thank you. Um, this is another kind of related question on that in terms of, of how things might change over time and how and commenting on them. Uh, Tatiana asks, is there a way to comment on other people's work, post a question, set, or suggest edits directly on their documents? Yeah, so you can't set edits on the documents, but each project is open. You can open it up for commenting. So that is available as well. But as far as my knowledge is, most people do not make use of that feature. And I have not made use of that feature before, but I do see the value of, of doing that. I think ultimately what the project allows you to do is it gives you that flexibility, but whether it's because of general research practices or a lack of awareness of that feature, people aren't taking advantage of that commenting section. But as, as to your question about individual files, no, I do not believe it's possible to, to make individual comments as a, as a spectator or as a viewer of those, that content. Great, thanks. Um, now here's a big question and one that I think goes into a lot of our work on uh, things like data management plans. Mm -hmm. uh, what happens to OSF projects when the PI moves on or goes away? Like what happens to the research and the data? So that's a great question. And that applies directly as I, I obviously just showed you the NYU data catalog project. And I am no longer the head of that project because I no longer work at NYU, but my name is still on it. And for a while now I have been making, um, thinking about emailing that group to get my name off. And so if you have an institutional license that might make things more complicated, but ultimately I think the question comes up to the team as to who's responsible for that project and, and how it moves on through time. So if you have an institutional affiliation associated with it at the time it's published, that's always gonna be connected, but you can move a project or create a copy of a project to move it into another phase which can then account for someone potentially leaving an institution and going somewhere else. And that's known as forking. And I didn't talk about that, but you can essentially fork a project from somewhere else that's open so that you can use the same, same template and the same content that was used before. So you essentially would be creating another iteration of that project if the person left. Or if the project was never published and that person leaves and no longer contributes to the project, it's up to the group in a team science way to decide, do we continue to attribute the work to this person who's left or do we no longer do that within the context of our project? So there's many options you can take, but ultimately it comes down to a group decision as to how you do that. Thanks. Lots to think about. Yeah. Um, so we, you can fork projects. Uh, there's a question here, can you merge them as well? So you merge, Merging, as far as I know, is not possible. You can only fork them. So you can fork multiple projects into one, 
So that is an, that's an op, a possibility, but you can't take one and merge it into the other. Okay. Um, there are a lot of questions here about specific uh, aspects of the system, which I think we'll save for um, okay. you to answer offline, but a, a couple of big picture questions here that I think are really important. Okay. Um, not that all the questions aren't important, but some of them, some of them are easier to answer in typing than others. Okay. Um, so a question from Joanna, I'm thinking of raw data files of transcribed interviews, for example. Does data storage on OSF meet the safety requirements of research ethics boards in terms of rights management and encryption? So that is a wonderful question. And my answer to that question is it depends. <laughs> so, <laughs> so in working with others from multiple institutions before, I have seen ethics boards approve the use of OSF for things like qualitative data where personal identifying information could be exposed but those projects can never be made public in OSF. So they will always end up being private unless you can de-identify them or remove identifying information in some way so as people could never be recognized. So my understanding and my experience with that is that OSF is possible to be used as a storage system, but it would have to remain private always for that type of data. And you'll, you noticed when I tried to make my project public that it was recognized that way. Um, and then my other experience is people and ethics boards that flat out say, no, absolutely not. It's not done. It's not a safe enough infrastructure and they don't trust it and they'll say no. So I think depending on who your ethics board is, it is totally going to vary. But excellent question. Yes, definitely an excellent question. And I think we'll end on this one um, just for the sake of time. But again, thank you so much for all of the questions and I will be sending them to Kevin so that he can uh, respond to them. Uh, fully. I see that OSF is currently a nonprofit. What do you think is the likelihood that is that it is going to be taken over by a commercial profit driven entity at some point? I will not name the name that is particularly in the question. Uh, yeah, that's a great question. So I, I do know that the Center for Open Science has made a number of verbal commitments and to, to staying a nonprofit for the long term. Again, you never know what those verbal commitments mean when there's a big check in front of you from a big company. Um, so I think the fact that it's been going for this long and hasn't been purchased for someone, like OSF came out around the same time as Figshare, which did get purchased by one of those big not to be named companies. Same with Mendeley, um, whereas the Center for Open Science and the Open Science Framework has not. So I think you can take some comfort in the fact that for a long time, they've been truly committed to keeping research open and open source in this way. And I think that they're looking to make their money by having those institutions sign up for licenses through them so that they can have a stronghold as an infrastructure component to academic or hospitals or other institutions that are available to them. So I think from my perspective, I don't see that changing, but again, you never know and you never know how people are gonna react depending on the type of funds that they're offered um, and how that might change their perspective on things. But excellent question. But uh, from my perspective, I feel like take some comfort in that it hasn't changed since the beginning. Yeah, Thank I you. think that's that's a good way to approach it. And you know, we we can only do what we can do as as uh, data advocates to encourage it to stay open. Exactly. I would say. Given that we are 10 minutes past the hour, or I guess 40 minutes past the hour if you're uh, joining us from Newfoundland, I think we will finish up there. Um, as I mentioned, we will, I will be sending these questions to Kevin to, uh, so he can answer them offline. And, and thank you so much for all of your questions, everyone. They're really great. Yeah. Um, and thank you so much, Kevin, for this great overview of the system, the pros and the cons, and, and your insightful responses to the questions as well. Um, this has been really great. Thanks. Yeah, I, I hope people consider the idea and the practices of making their research open more broadly, especially those librarians on the call. We have to practice what we preach. And I think this is one way that we can do so. So thanks for your attention today and for letting me share my thoughts. <laughs>